Thank right. you everybody for joining us today. We appreciate you getting on our webinar um, and listening to Melissa and John talk about the update for the week. Um, as always, please mute your lines during the presentation and use the chat feature only for asking questions. Melissa and John will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, this is being recorded. We will be sure to put this out on our website and be sure to send the recording out to everybody that did pre-register for the, the webinar. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to John to kick us off. Thank you, Hope, and welcome everyone to this week's edition of the weekly webinar. Appreciate you spending some time with us to get updates on what's happening um, in Pennsylvania and the industry relative to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I would remind you that this call is off the record. It's designed for and intended for the use of our restaurant and hotel and travel and tourism partners and is not uh, designed as a press call. Uh, we're happy to accommodate the press at any given time and do so regularly, but this, this call is off the record. So if you're a member of the press and you happen to be happen to have dialed in today, please dis disconnect. And with that, I'm happy to turn the uh, program over to Melissa Boba. Melissa? Good morning, everyone. Uh, so to begin, I've gotten this question actually a few times since last week. I have moved my office to my third bedroom, which is why there is a different background because I cannot have one of those fancy backgrounds that John and other people have. So welcome to the guest bedroom. Uh, and as you are used to, Macy sometimes will make an appearance on her day bed behind me. So that is the reason I am in a different location. I did have one person ask if I was in witness protection, probably a valid question considering how things have been going the last few weeks, but no, I have just moved the office uh, to the upstairs bedroom. So with that, we're going to just go through federal and state probably pretty swiftly and then get into the reason that every single one of you have joined the call today. But of course, I threw in other information that I'm going to go over as well because each week I do try to, to highlight what I'm getting a lot of questions on and do a bit of a deep dive there. Let's talk federal. COVID-4, which is the next COVID package, which we certainly hope will be trillions of dollars in an effort to help all of us get through this crisis, which seems to keep on rearing its ugly head uh, in the restaurant industry space right now. You should have received uh, last week an email from the National Restaurant Association that basically has a list of various priorities. And you are being asked to rank them, your top three and then maybe your least three which will be the basis of what we will be working on actively as part of the next recovery package. So it is really important that if you have not taken that survey, that you do it because that is the basis of the blueprint that will be part of the next recovery package. There are a lot of different pieces of federal legislation out there right now. Each of them deal with things that we would all like. Some of them include a lot of things that we would all like, but as we've seen throughout this entire crisis, it is those multi-trillion dollar packages that are being debated. So the list that you provide to the National Restaurant Association right now will be the basis of what we're asking for. I'm not trying to give you any ideas, but liability protection would be a good one to maybe list. Uh, also, uh, coverage for that business interruption insurance that hasn't been paid out. Uh, and then it certainly wouldn't hurt for you to show uh, some support for some tax credits. All of that PPE and barriers and everything you're investing in, uh, those are just some of the things that are on the list. So take a look and uh, put out, you know, what would be helpful for you, because like I said, that will be the basis of the next push in terms of recovery. Other items, uh, the P3, every week I feel like I have a, an update uh, for the P3. So we did have an extension that was signed by the president earlier this week. And as you all know, because I told you all of this in the webinar last week, the application period for you to draw down on a P3 loan ended on June 30th. That has now been extended to August 8th. This only applies to you if you have not already drawn down on the P3. So it is not a second attempt or a second hit for those of you that have already drawn down. It's only for those of you that might not have taken advantage of the P3 yet. There is about $125 billion left in that fund. So if you haven't drawn down, I'm sick of saying this, you probably should because the, the perks right now of drawing it down are certainly helpful um, 
and are going to be important as we're moving through the next few weeks. For those of you who already received a loan, I've gotten a lot of this question uh, primarily from my friends in the Southwest that are in a whole new world right now, unfortunately, as it pertains to COVID cases, that we believe that as part of the next recovery package, that there might be language that would include potentially a second drawdown. So if you drew down $100,000 the first time, maybe you could draw down $50,000 as a second round of P3 funding, since there's so much funding that wasn't taken advantage of. This is going to be something that we'll be advocating for especially for those of you that drew down immediately because we told you to and it was the right thing to do uh, in April because by the time we got the fix from the eight weeks to 24 weeks, 75, 25 to 60, 40, you were already at the end of your eight week period. So you really couldn't take advantage of some of the changes that took effect in the beginning of June. So that's why there is discussion about letting it, especially those of you who drew down in, immediately in the first round of funding to be able to draw down again. So that's something that we're discussing. I think that this is going to get a lot of attention. You've, you've been reading the news. You probably have seen that the, the SBA has released the people that have applied for the P3 loans. And universally, restaurants were not the largest applicants. We were second in a lot of places. Uh, so I think there's going to be some focus on if we're going to allow a setting to draw down focusing on the industries that are especially suffering in this crisis. And of course, and unfortunately, that would be uh, our industry initially. So don't be off on P3 if you drew down first. We are looking to get a second on that. Uh, all of that is probably part of that COVID-4 package. And I would be lying if I didn't say um, that it sounds like, it, it, are people having trouble hearing me? You were being a little choppy there, but it seems like it cleared up. Did you, are you, is your fan on or is anything blowing near, nearby nope. that may be trying to take over? Okay. It's just my computer trying to live. Okay. It sounds all right now. Okay. To me. I didn't say anything too exciting, trust me. Um, but if I break up, let me know and, and I can try and reboot and have John fill in for a few minutes. Um, but definitely, as I said, P3 is going to be a topic of discussion for the next COVID package. And there is, for my DMOs, uh, there is talk about having 501 c 6 and other nonprofits be eligible as well. So that is all part of a broader conversation. Let's talk about state. Freeze. Okay. Um, I really jinxed myself. Um, in terms of, of the state and me saying that session was over because they are back in session right now. The House is in session this week and the House and Senate will both be in session next to start moving pieces of legislation. A lot it has to do uh, with the, am I breaking up again, Eric? You are breaking yeah. up. You want to try calling it on your phone maybe and see if we can use the audio from your phone? Yeah, let's try. John, you want to fill in while my computer tries to? Yeah. Do you want me to give an update on Southwest? I would. I would like to wait until we get to that portion because I'd okay. like to talk about COVID cases first. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the legal portion, the the governor's, the, the lawsuit, the House Senate resolutions. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, as you all know, uh, the House and the Senate had a resolution uh, to its. It was a different kind of resolution this time, but it was another piece of legislation to essentially declare that the governor did not have the authority to manage the state of emergency. Uh, and that ended up being fast-tracked to the Supreme Court with a, um, with a procedure called King's Bench. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled last week after considering it for a couple of weeks that the governor indeed does have the authority to manage the state of emergency and that the legislation as the legislation was presented to try to take that away, could not stand because legislation has to be presented to the governor uh, before it can become legislation. So consequently, the impact of it was that uh, once again, and this is at least the third time, the, uh, the state has upheld the governor's authority to manage a state of emergency, um, which um, Melissa, I don't know whether you're ready yet or not, if you are, uh, fine. If not, I'll keep talking. I can continue on this subject for a moment. So I'll just wait till you. Un I'll wait till I see you. Give me the thumbs up. 
Uh, I also want to address this subject, if I may, briefly for everyone on the call. Throughout the crisis, the governor's uh, authority to manage the state of emergency has been upheld at least three times by the courts. Legislation that's tr attempted to take it away has been either vetoed or overruled by the courts. And um, that is the situation that we're in. Uh, and so consequently, those that are upset and think that there should, there should be a different position taken with the governor and with, uh, in this case, Rich Fitzgerald, the county executive in Allegheny County, that isn't an alternative. It's been tried and tested and, it's, and, it, and it cannot work. So we made the decision early on to work with the governor on trying to get things reopened and try to get them reopened in a fashion that was as favorable to restaurants as possible and still safe. And we ended up with some of the probably most balanced guidelines in the country when we got into green, the first phase of restaurant reopening uh, to try to help restaurants get to the other side of this. That's our number one goal, to keep restaurants open, keep them open in a fashion that they can operate and that they can, um, and that they can survive. Uh, and that's what, in addition to the legislation that Melissa's uh, obviously working on and talking about, and those we're working with our national partners, it's our first priority. And we've had, we have a very good uh, ongoing relationship discussing issues with the governor, discussing enforcement, discussing getting bad actors out of the picture so that we can keep all the good actors open. Uh, so those are the, that's kind of the approach we're taking and we continue to take it. And as far as we can tell, it's the only approach. So I think now, as soon as Eric unmutes Melissa, she'll be back on. All right, let's, let's see how we, do this time. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, PRLA priorities heading into the fall. We had a call yesterday, uh, starting with some of our committee meetings, where we started prioritizing things that the industry is going to need to help our recovery once we enter the fall session. We are planning to bump up some of those priorities since they're in session next week. And quite honestly, uh, the industry is taking a pretty big hit right now in terms of increasing cases. So we will be. Uh, focusing on liability protection, uh, grant programs, all of this will be a focus of us next week with the House and in session to try and get some relief to all of you sooner than later, at least starting those conversations sooner than later as it pertains to um, relief. So stay tuned to that. I know uh, people are frustrated and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we end up from there. So that is going to be something that we're focusing on over the next few weeks. You still hearing me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, some specific items I want to cover because we're getting a lot of questions on this front. Um, we have been, whether we like it or not, as we are reopening, we have employees that are testing positive for COVID. And I know that there have been some discrepancies. I was actually on a webinar yesterday with the city of Pittsburgh where they had different guidelines for if you had somebody test positive than the actual state guidelines. So we, we have some discrepancies here. So I wanted to go over some of the guidance for all of you in terms of if somebody tests positive. If you have an employee either showing symptoms, they do not need to have tested yet, and this is key because some of these tests are taking three to four to five days to turn around. If an employee is showing symptoms or they've tested positive, the rule of thumb is, and I'm going to tell you the rule of thumb, and then I'm going to tell you what you should be doing, is that you need to secure any area where they were for 24 hours and do a deep clean. Now, the guidance itself says 24 hours or as much as practicable, and then it says specific areas. Within restaurants specifically, hotels are a different animal, within restaurants specifically, you are going to want to shut down for 24 hours and do a deep clean. If you have an employee that was working within two or three days of them being tested, you are gonna to wanna to shut down for 24 hours. Best practice, do a deep clean. That is what you, you need to do for an employee that tests positive. Now, what you also need to be doing is informing employees that were within the vicinity of the person who tested positive, that somebody that they are in the vicinity of has tested positive. They are not required to quarantine from day one of you informing them. Now they can, 
um, but they're not required to. But as soon as you have an employee that tests positive, you need to be temperature checking your employees for 14 days after that. And then it's kind of, you know, the pathway of if they're showing symptoms, they need to go home for 14 days, they need to get tested. But you do not need to require any employee within the vicinity to quarantine right off the bat. If they show symptoms, they need to go home and quarantine. And that's gonna be key in terms of, like I said, lag time between the test and the results. If somebody goes and they get a test and five days later they found out that they just had strep throat, they still cannot work. If they're showing symptoms, if they're presumptive positive, they cannot be working. So that is a key part in this. And like I said, for restaurants, uh, the guidance does say if you um, just need to, like I said, clean the areas that the employee was at, it is impossible for you to ascertain that they didn't go to the bathroom, that they didn't go visit their friends at a table if they work back in the kitchen. So for restaurants, your best practice is going to be 24 hours. For the hotels, you are going to want to shut down any areas that employee was in for 24 hours <clears throat> or restrict access to it until you can do that deep clean. Uh, you should also be informing uh, if there is a local health department, you should be informing their local health department if you had an employee test positive as well. Uh, typically, the testing site should be doing it, but since there is that lag time, uh, we do have some health departments like Allegheny County that want to be informed immediately. So that's, and like I said, I know some places, uh, Allegheny County said that you have to um, shut down for 24 hours, not necessary, but for restaurants, you really should just because of the space in which you're operating. I, I want to reiterate this again, because I think that there, um, I don't want to say there are people that don't, aren't following the rules, but if you have an employee that is quarantined because a health official thinks they have COVID or they have COVID, you do need to provide paid leave to them. You will be reimbursed for it under family first. But if you have an employee that is told to quarantine because their family member has it and they have to stay home because the health official told them to quarantine for 14 days, or if they tested positive, you need to be providing them paid leave. That is, is something that I, I think everybody is doing, but if you aren't, you do need to do that. So please keep that in the back of your mind that they need to be paid for up to two weeks, up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at the regular rate of pay uh, if they are unable to work because they're quarantined or they are experiencing uh, symptoms of COVID uh, on that front. So please don't forget to be providing them that, that paid leave because it is required under the federal law. It's not optional. Like I said, you will be reimbursed for it, but it's, it is required. And this is the Federal Department of Labor. So as I said before, they're no joke. So make sure that you are doing that if somebody does test positive because we are seeing more positive cases. The, the question of the week, uh, we have, uh, similar to other states, and other states are being more forceful, we have a recommendation from our Secretary of Health that if you have an employee that is returning from a state that has a high incidence of cases, or if you are a hotel and you have a guest that is coming from one of these states with a high rate of cases, they need to quarantine for 14 days. This is this is just once again, you know, that kind of frustrating gray area that we operate in. And even I think the Secretary of Health has come out and said that there is not really any teeth to this. What you need to do is be informing employees that they should be quarantining. You are not required to provide them paid leave for a self-imposed quarantine. You are only required to provide paid leave if a health official tells them that they need to quarantine. So if an employee comes back, and they came from Florida from spring break or whatever it would be called now, and they are going to quarantine for two weeks, you're not required to offer paid leave, but you're also um, not required to force them to either. You should be advising people to, to quarantine, but there's no penalty on the employer if an employee says, no, I'm coming back to work. To that end, for uh, the hotels that have guests coming from out of state, what we're seeing in terms of guidance is that it would make sense for you to put a sign at the check-in desk informing guests that are coming from those states that they're requested to quarantine for 14 days. And you are not, again, the enforcer of this, but it is your job to inform people that this is a request of the governor and the secretary of health. So again, 
this is not one of those LCE is going to come in and fine you because the person coming in from Delaware it did not quarantine for 14 days, but there is personal responsibility on their end and an obligation on your end to inform them of the need to quarantine. And so that I think answers some of the, the questions I've gotten because I know I've had a lot of hotels ask about this. And this is very similar to when we were in the red phase as well in terms of the travel ban. You are required to instruct people that they should not be traveling, but you are not the enforcer of people that of their own free will are choosing not to follow that. And from this point on, I'm going to turn it back to John um, to really kind of fill in on the what we're seeing and the Allegheny County piece. And hopefully I will continue to not skip. By the way, uh, since you regrouped, Melissa, you've sounded great. So thank you for that. Uh, so uh, first, around the country, uh, we're seeing a rise in increases uh, throughout the country. I think there's 21 states now that have significant increases. Uh, and as Melissa touched on earlier, Pennsylvania, New York, and some of the initial hotspots have now uh, put into place essentially travel bans from, uh, I think, as many as 16 or 17 states. It's not technically a travel ban, but it's a self-quarantine if you travel from those states into either Pennsylvania or New York. So it's really been a turn of events, if you will. Uh, the, uh, so what's happening is that throughout the country, uh, further restrictions are being placed on to businesses um, and in particular restaurants. Uh, and uh, a lot of people don't think it's fair that restaurants are so-called singled out. The rationale, and I'm not I'm a health expert, but the rationale is that when people spend more time uh, in one place around other people, there's more likelihood to be a transmission of the virus. And that's why they're keying in on the restaurant community around the country, not just in Pennsylvania and Allegheny County. So consequently, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've had a relationship with the governor's team throughout this in trying to uh, help to ensure that, number one, the standards that are uh, in place are not only safe, but sensible, and that, uh, and that we keep people safe, but that we do it in a practical way. Uh, we've had conversations ongoing, including uh, last week and last night, about the fact that there is a spike, not just in Allegheny County, but elsewhere in the state, and there is a concern about that. And, the, and I will say that the, the, um, the desire of the governor's team is to do everything they can to stop the spread and to, and to stop people from getting sick or dying, and at the same time keep businesses open and not move backwards, at least not backwards in a dramatic way. Whether we can do that or not is, um, is um, a question mark. A lot of it has to do with how we act. And uh, this is one of the problems that Allegheny County faced two weekends ago, is that in addition to having a spike, there, is a, there was a, um, a fair amount of highly publicized uh, restaurants and or bars that were not following the standards. In particular, face masks and social distancing, the two most important things. There's no longer any question that face masks are the most important thing to stop the spread, and they weren't following either one of those. And then in addition to that, there was congregating, which is probably, and obviously you can't congregate and have social distancing. Congregating is a huge problem, and it has been seen not only in Pittsburgh uh, and other places in the state, but also in Philadelphia. So consequently, the Allegheny uh, County Executive, Rich Fitzgerald, along with uh, and the actual order came from Dr. Bogan, the health commissioner for the uh, Allegheny County Department of Health, made the decision first to eliminate the um, uh, consumption of alcohol in public places, and then second to close restaurants entirely uh, for at least a week, which was announced last Friday. Uh, and uh, we've had ongoing discussions with, uh, with Mr. Fitzgerald and his chief of staff, and they've been positive about how we can get restaurants, keep restaurants alive and keep people alive at the same time. And so we anticipate that we're going to have a good partnership like we've had with the, the, um, with the governor. Certainly people are upset, people are losing their businesses, and it's very, uh, very, very challenging right now. We understand that and feel for every one of them. Um, yesterday, Dr. Bogan, uh, the uh, Allegheny County Health Department Commissioner, uh, gave a press conference along with Mr. Fitzgerald, at which time she said that they were considering some adjustments depending on the accounts uh, to Allegheny County. 
since restaurants are closed right now, the adjustments would could only be positive, uh, but it's going to depend on the count. There should be a press conference today to talk about that. In addition, there was some um, press last night about uh, other counties near Allegheny County that may have further restrictions in their restaurants. Um, according to our uh, context, the press accounts may have been premature and that there should be some decisions made today about that. So uh, watch for announcements in that regard. Um, so we continue to have a good relationship with the governor's team and we're focused on, um, on helping in every way we can with getting the word out and helping uh, and, and, and definitely advocating for increased enforcement on the part of the LCE. And I would point out that the governor's stance all along has been enforcement should be in a way that recognizes people that are trying to do the right thing and help them do it better and not be uh, overly heavy handed if restaurants and businesses are trying to do the right thing. All the reports we have have been that that's been carried out. But you should look at stepped up enforcement. We received notice just a few minutes ago that licensees have received a notice about stepped up enforcement, particularly in the areas of face masks, social distancing, and no congregating. So those are the things that you should be focused on more than anything else if you're in the restaurant business. If we can do that, there's a high likelihood that we can remain open at some capacity and continue to do business. So um, though there's a, as I mentioned, there'll be some announcements today and hopefully those announcements will be positive uh, in some form or fashion, but absolutely uh, be prepared for further restrictions if we can't get the case count under control and if we can't get people following the rules. Um, so with that, I'll uh, turn it back to Melissa and, um, <clears throat> oh, let me lastly say as you're warming up again, Melissa, we're really focusing on, in addition to all the legislative things that Melissa is so diligently working on, we're really focusing on keeping restaurants open and in particular getting the word out about the importance of masks, distancing, and congregating. And uh, that's got to be the number one focus and we're gonna be spending a lot of time on that, a lot of time with the governor's team on how we can help to ensure that that gets done uh, in, in some, some way through information resources. So please, if you have a, uh, a friend who's not operating the way that they should be operating, and you are, which I'm sure you are, please take the time to make a quick call and let them know it's important not just to save people from getting sick or maybe from dying, but also for saving businesses. So with that, let me turn it back to you, Melissa, and then if there's anything else you want me to do, let me know. Yeah. Um just to, to follow up on John, as he said, we are expecting an announcement uh, for what we would refer to as the collar counties of Allegheny County. Uh, that will be today. It, it will not happen until after the noon counts are released and we kind of see where we are. Uh, Secretary, or, uh, Dr. Bogan made it very clear that she reserved the right not to make any changes that the counts of Allegheny County increase exponentially. So we are not expecting an announcement until this afternoon. Uh, for the collar counties, it would come from the state, and those press conferences are ranging. They can be at two o'clock, three o'clock, and then so as uh, Steph Otterson, our, our director of communications, and I so fondly love, we'll do a five o'clock around here and there. Um, but we do expect something to be announced. Not sure, as John said, of the exact parameters, and I want to reiterate that. Because of the media stories yesterday, a lot of people thought that changes, shutdowns, requirements started yesterday uh, for counties surrounding Allegheny, and that is not the case. Uh, there were just people who were really excited to speak to the media, and inaccurate information was put out there. So nothing has changed in terms of operations for collar counties around Allegheny County as of 1131 on Wednesday, July 8th. So as soon as parameters or restrictions, if they are put into place, we will get that out there. But right now, uh, there is no official announcement other than speculation and people speaking to the press probably a little too early. And as John said, this is something that I'm watching the Southeast like a hawk. Um, we're all watching cases. Everybody went down the shore uh, for the 4th of July weekend. So these are all things that we're gonna be keeping an eye on moving forward over the next couple of weeks. Uh, Segwaying to Philadelphia, uh, as you all know, last week Philadelphia did announce they would not be allowing indoor dining. I had a call with their health department uh, on Friday 
that I was hopeful to talk about how do we get indoor dining open. And they were quite honest in their uh, opinion that too many restaurants aren't doing outdoor dining properly. They're not appropriately social distancing. They're not requiring guests to wear masks. They're not requiring their employees to wear masks or their employees are not wearing them appropriately. And quite honestly, Philadelphia said, if restaurants can't do outdoor dining right, why the heck would we allow you to do indoor dining? And, and that's where we are on that front. So for Philadelphia specifically, they do not uh, anticipate allowing indoor dining until August 1st. So we have about three weeks uh, to really show them that the restaurant industry can do it right. Uh, I know Ben Felicia, our director of operations for the Philadelphia regions on the call. Uh, he has been key in terms of trying to reach out to restaurants. You, it's all self-enforcement. We all need you guys to call out the bad guys because we're not going to move forward. We're not going to see a reverse in these cases until we start calling out those that aren't following the rules. And that's really what the problem is in Philadelphia. I think we're seeing a shift there uh, in terms of people really doing the right thing uh, and, and ensuring that social distancing, but they will start shutting you down in Philadelphia, just like we're seeing across the state. There's not gonna be any more warnings. I know some people were told they would get three warnings before it shut down. We're beyond that at this point. And quite frankly, we can't afford more warnings if three warnings means an increase in cases and we can't do indoor dining uh, across the state anymore. So for Philadelphia, I would love to think they would allow indoor dining before August 1st. I don't see it. And I would not be surprised as we already saw if we see a, a few more further restrictions in Philadelphia as it pertains to indoor dining than we might be seeing across the rest of the state. And to that end, we might be seeing some more state um, changes as well to ensure that we are staying ahead of the case count. So we're not going backwards like so many other states have. And John has been doing a great job communicating with the governor's office. We have really been spending a lot of time trying to, to find the path that goes after the problem actors without hurting all of you that have invested thousands of dollars in revamping your restaurants and operating safely. And we are cognizant of that. And the governor's office is cognizant of that. And we will continue uh, to have those conversations. Uh, and as is up there. We are expecting a report on state mitigation efforts in some southwest counties, um, primarily the collar counties around Allegheny. And as soon as we get that information, it will be later this afternoon. Uh, from what we're hearing, it would be a Thursday implementation. So it's not um, depending. We're hoping it's a Thursday implementation. But really, these case counts that we're expecting at noon, I think, is really going to, to show us uh, what the path forward is going to be and what the mitigation requirements are going to be. There's a lot of information out there. Please do not pay attention to the information out there until the Secretary of Health makes an announcement. I know that there is, there is a rumor that everyone's going to shut down like Allegheny County, that no more groups of no more than 25. Uh, all of that is just hearsay at this point. So I will say this again, and hopefully it will stop two or three or 10 of you from emailing me, asking me to verify what's going to happen. We don't know yet, and we expect that announcement today. Uh, and then, as, as we've said before, I'm not gonna defend you if you are not having your employees wear masks or shields or your customers. If you're not doing social distancing. Uh, we can't help you at this point in time. They're gonna shut you down. And for all of you that are doing the right thing, it's the right thing to do to shut down those that aren't following the rules. And from there, I think we're gonna do general resources and then take all of the questions. And then maybe my computer will just start skipping again and I won't have to answer all the hard questions. John, you wanna- I'm, so sure. I'm not so sure, all of you are on every week and these are the same things we've had there. Uh, the restaurant and hotel promise are really important though. It was something that I will say that when we met with uh, Rich Fitzgerald in uh, Allegheny County, he really liked the concept of the restaurant promise and getting people to voluntarily agree to do the right things. Uh, and the governor has too. So if you haven't already downloaded it, you should download it, you should use the material. It just says that I'm trying to do the right thing and it goes a long way in us as an industry being responsible. Uh, and then the second one is uh, just some best practices there for reopening restaurants. Um, so with that, I don't know what the next slide is. That might be it.
uh, upcoming webinars. Hope, do you want to talk about these? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, these are actually not sponsored by us, but they're when that the um, National Restaurant Association and the AHMLA will be um, having coming up um, later today. The one um, is uh, a great town hall that if you have the time to join at 2 p.m., please register on our website. Um, and then we'll be back next week with Melissa, of course, for an industry update. And um, as we get more webinars, we'll let you know. Um, and that's about all we've got for webinars this, this week. I will, even though I told Hope I wasn't going to talk about it today, I will talk about it. We um, were hoping to do a webinar with our friends from LCE uh, regarding enforcement, uh, just because of the fact that there's so much gray area right now. They are going to be putting together essentially a list of what they see as the top 10 issues when they're out looking as it pertains to COVID. Uh, and then we will be opening it up for all of you to submit questions back to the LCE, specific questions that you might have regarding enforcement that they are being kind enough to answer. So that is another resource uh, directly from the people who are enforcing this uh, if you have specific questions that they will be able to answer. So that I think is going to be a great resource moving forward because while I can always speculate, they're the ones finding you and shutting you down. So uh, I think that's going to be really helpful as well. Okay, shall we go to questions? Um, hi, Melissa, I was out over the weekend and noticed at three different restaurants, cooks and chefs not wearing masks or gloves while working on the line open kitchen. Is there, is there an exemption for them or is it a violation? So here's, and, and I will, Allegheny County, thank you, Macy, for joining us. Um, Allegheny County actually talked about this uh, earlier in, in their webinar yesterday they really should at least have a face shield on. And if it's a huge issue and they can't because it infringes, there is an exemption of if a mask infringes with somebody's ability to do their job, there is an exemption there. But there's also the fact that if your customers are seeing your cooks or your chefs with no protection whatsoever, they're probably gonna file a complaint against you. So I would encourage people to look into those shields uh, we were on a call earlier today with one of our members who said that those shields actually have been a big help in terms of uh, employees that have asthma uh, or get claustrophobic uh, and also in terms of breathability as well. So I would say best case scenario of what you should be doing, try and get those face shields for your cooks and chefs. John, do you have anything to add there? I don't. Uh, and Melissa, you covered it exactly right. Um, the ch and the only thing that we didn't talk about was gloves. Uh, gloves are required in whatever the health code is. That hasn't changed with COVID. Uh, so there is no additional requirement for gloves. So if they're cooking, they're, and depending on how they're handling food, they're probably required to wear gloves. So they should be anyway. Um, I think that question was from Dominic. Um, and then uh, beyond that, um, I, I agree with Melissa 100%. You should be doing everything you can to have them wear face masks. Rich Fitzgerald addressed this in Allegheny County yesterday, said if for some reason they can't, like it impedes their job, then there should be additional social distancing. Uh, so uh, probably a wise comment, actually. Uh, can you email us guidelines on employees who test positive? If Ben hasn't already put it up there, uh, if you go onto the resource page for the state regarding business guidance, there is the state guidance for any employee that tests positive um, what you need to do in terms of waiting 24 hours, when people can return to work, uh, temperature checking, all of that is included in the business guidance for employers on the governor's website. Uh, but we can get that out there as well. In addition to that sign you need to post as well uh, that we've talked about in the past too, that is included in the business guidance. How are employers reimbursed for pay for a quarantine employee that you would be paying? Under the families first, you deduct that pay out of the federal taxes that you would be remitting. So if you are remitting $5,000 in your federal taxes and your pay for the person who had to stay home for two weeks equals uh, $3,000, you would deduct the $3,000 from your remittance in terms of taxes. If you have a bunch of employees that um, are, have COVID or staying home and that exceeds your tax amount, 
you can ask for a rebate from the IRS. Uh, and that guidance is on the IRS website. And I will clarify here, Families First is, because I most of it applies to most of you on the call. It's for those of you with less than 500 employees. So if you are a business with more than 500, you're not covered by families. You're not covered by the reimbursement of the families first. It's for those of you with 500 employees or less, whether you are public or a private business. Um, but you, like I said, if you are, you would be deducting that from what you would be remitting in terms of your taxes. And that is on the IRS website. Um, where can we find verbiage on Allegheny County Health Department's guidelines regarding an employee who has symptoms and or test positive? I caught some of the summary from your call with Pittsburgh yesterday, but not all of it, and want to make sure I have the correct information. Allegheny County is not different than the state. I just think that on their webinar yesterday, they didn't delineate what is best practice and what um, you should be doing. So. Allegheny County on the webinar yesterday and if you are in Allegheny County every Tuesday the health department is doing a webinar and taking questions so I urge you to participate in that. They had said you need to shut down for 24 hours uh, if there is a case. Then they backpedaled a little bit and said well if that person hasn't worked for a few days you don't necessarily need to shut down for 24 hours. So that's why I wanted to clarify that best practice if you are a restaurant and you can't delineate exactly where that employee was over the course of their shifts that they might have been symptomatic, you should shut down and clean the entire restaurant. For hotels, you're looking at a different scenario there. You should be prioritizing and figuring out where that employee was and shutting down those areas, recognizing that it would be impossible for you to shut down the entire hotel. Um, but there was that delineation. Yesterday they came right out to 24 hours and then they kind of took a step back. So that's why I wanted to make it clear what the state guidance was as it pertains to that COVID case. Um, is the requirement to provide paid leave from Families First Act or U.S. Department of Labor? Where is this requirement defined? Uh, did you see that restaurants are to notify the local health department if an employee tests positive? Uh, Families First Act is the federal law enforced by the U.S. Department of Labor. So the, the U.S. Department of Labor is the enforcement agency. So Families First Act is the law. The U.S. Department of Labor is the enforcer of that law. Uh, and then they're requesting, and this was an Allegheny County thing, which might be something to think about. You are not required to inform your local health department. The uh, testing site, the hospital should, is informing them, but because in some places, like in the Southwest, where there's an, a surge in cases, and there is, in some cases, three to five days between when somebody takes the test and when they get the test results, they would like to have a heads up on that front. So you're not required to, it is suggested that you inform your local health department. Uh, we do not, I don't know if Allegheny County, do you know when the Allegheny County press conference is scheduled for? I don't know if they're necessarily going to have a press conference today. It might be just a press release like they did last week because they have a press conference once a week. So I, I would not say that they will necessarily have a press conference. I, I would anticipate it would be a release. Uh, but like I said, we don't have a, a set timeline on any of that. Melissa, well, I think you're right, and I think I confused the issue by saying there would be a press conference today. Yesterday's press conference was the Wednesday one that was moved up a day earlier, and I wouldn't be surprised if Melissa's right. There's just an announcement today that comes out about potentially some different mitigation for restaurants in Allegheny County, but uh, that may well be what's going to happen. There's nothing scheduled right now. Uh, so if we have an employee who has been out of work since March 12th with no COVID, however, she has a history of bad asthma and her respiratory doctor has said she remains out of work till masks are no longer necessary. She's received a signed FMLA form from her doctor. We have less than 50 employees. What should we do to be within guidelines? That is not covered, Michael. I'll look again, but that scenario is not covered under families first. Uh, two weeks could be covered if her doctor says that she needs to quarantine, but that specific scenario uh, is not covered under Families First. Uh, and since you are on less than 50 employees, it's not necessarily covered on FMLA, so unemployment 
would probably be the scenario in, in terms of that. And they would be able to collect unemployment in that scenario. But Families First only provides if you um, have COVID, have to quarantine because of COVID, you have a child who can't go to school uh, because of COVID, and then there's extended paid leave uh, if you have a child that is unable to go to school because of COVID. Uh, and like I said, we have had multiple webinars on Families First, uh, and I know I've begged and pleaded all of you to participate in those, so I would definitely check the archives and look at some of the details on Families First if you're not comfortable with it yet. Um, do we know if they close restaurant dining rooms in those counties, what time and when will they close? Tomorrow would be great to have 24 hours notice. John and I have both promised and sworn and pinky swore to each other that we would not speculate on this one. So when the announcement is made, if there's an announcement made today, that is when we'll know. Uh, we're not, we're not going not gonna to guess on this one. <laughs> Melissa is totally correct on that. I will say that we've reiterated the importance of some notice. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll get it, but we've reiterated the importance on both ways, either opening or closing, that notice is required. Um, this should not just pertain to Philadelphia County. It is completely unacceptable what is happening in Delaware County. I think that might be the, the not allowing of indoor dining. Um, I mean, we're seeing Delaware County hasn't had quite a surge. Box is seeing an increase. Uh, but this is, I mean, a lot of things have kept me up at night since March. Lately, it really is. I mean, John and I are watching these numbers like a hawk because if we see an increase, you might see something in Philadelphia being extended to the collar counties. I, I think it's, we would be naive not to recognize that if case counts increase. So, um, while Delaware County is not there yet, and we certainly hope they won't be, we want all of you to be open and to be safe. But if there are restaurants that aren't following the rules and you see that, you need to inform LCE, you need to inform Department of Ag, because if they operate and they are the reason that COVID spreads, you're all going to be shut down. And that doesn't help anyone. So I don't want anyone to have to be like Philadelphia right now. I'd like the enforcement and the rules to be applied so we can continue to operate and the 90%, 95% that are doing the right thing can continue to do so. I'm going to I'm going to read this one and I'm going to let John answer it because John is a master at the math questions. Uh, what is recommended for restaurant managers and employees as far as how to handle people who aren't wearing masks? Is signage that masks are required enough? Are we expected to harass our guests or is it fair to assume they have a medical condition if they aren't wearing one? Concern is not wanting to upset the guests we have since our biggest concern is sales. Um, initially when the when the uh, guidelines or when the orders came out, I should say, and face masks were required, uh, we've been asked many times, how much are we expected to do as policemen? And early on, it was said through administration sources, you're not expected to be the policeman. You're expected to make sure that people are advised that they have to have a face mask on the inside of a public building. Uh, let me read to you what we just received from the um, PLCB uh, regarding this, and maybe that'll give you some more guidance. Uh, but uh, in advance of the holiday weekend, you're reminded on behalf of the governor's office, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, the Pennsylvania State Police Bureau of Liquor and, uh, Control Enforcement, and the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board, that as a liquor licensee, you're required to abide by masking and social distancing requirements to help slow the spread of COVID-19. In bold letters, if you do not require employees and customers to wear masks and maintain social distancing, according to the governor's guidance for business and restaurant and retail food service industry, and the PLCB supplemental guidance, you may face citation by PLCE, fines and or suspension or revoke, uh, revocation of your liquor license. Now, if you're not a licensee, this is being enforced by, I believe, the Department of Agriculture if you don't have your own health department. So they're very serious about they have to take a firmer stance. So I can't tell you what you would do. If I was a restaurant operator, I would take a firmer stance. If people came in my restaurant, as much as I hate to do this because I'm a life of service kind of guy, I would say you're required by uh, law to have a face mask on in this restaurant. You either need to go get one uh, or I have one that I'd be happy to sell you at cost so that you can have one. And if you want to do that and sell one at cost, it's up to you. That's just what I would do. And I would be adamant about it because um, 
where not only are you going to get shut down, but the restaurants around you're going to get shut down and people are going to get sick and die. So um, that's what I would do in the case. A little bit different than how this started out, but things have been changing daily. We all know that. I, I second I mean, what John said. At this point, uh, they've made it very clear, the state and county health departments have made it very clear that if you are not requiring your guests to wear them, you will get in trouble for it. And you might lose some guests because of that. And that's a terrible experience to have right now, but uh, being shut down is going to be worse financially at the end of the day. Uh, long term, what are your thoughts on changing alcohol licensing so that it distinguished bar, restaurant, and nightclub beyond what's happened in co with COVID in Allegheny? Mostly bars reported, but orders applied to restaurants too. They have very different operations and safety risks. From a state licensing perspective, nothing, we're, trust me, I've been lobbying for 15 years. Nothing's going to change in terms of the delineation of an R license applying to a nightclub and an R license applying to a restaurant. That won't change. Um, we have seen in other states that they have had some requirements that said if more than 50% of your sales are from alcohol, you need to shut down. As John, you know, we've talked about it internally, it's unenforceable. How would you enforce it? You don't have enough people on the boots on the ground as it is in terms of enforcement. They certainly don't have time to look at your books and determine what your percentages are. So I don't, I don't see a, a delineation on that front. I do see parameters potentially that will be put in place to stop what we're seeing, which is late night drinking and people out drinking a lot and they, their masks are gone. Uh, they're standing around with their friends. They are bypassing the front, you know, your, uh, your host or hostess and going on all of that is where the problem is. So we're not going to see a delineation there. I think that we will see maybe some changes in terms of operations and how late you can serve alcohol and things like that in an effort to kind of carve out where the problem areas are. Uh, in a private event, such as a wedding, are we required to police our guests in terms of wearing masks when they are not seated, as well as the social distancing, or is it sufficient to have signage? You're putting your employees at risk as well if you are not policing the guests wearing masks. So you need to think big picture on this, is that if you are not uh, one, putting it in the contract that guests need to wear masks when they're not seated. Uh, if you are not ensuring that people know that they need to be wearing masks and they're running around and dancing and talking or whatever, and now you have five employees that caught COVID because the guests at the wedding were drinking too much wine and weren't wearing their masks, I mean, that's going to be a much bigger issue for you, in addition to the enforcement from LCE and Department of Ag. And I know, and as John said, we know how inconvenient it is and we know how frustrating it is. But if we don't get this under control, you will not have weddings anymore. They will shut down. We'll be back to 25 guests or less. We'll go shut down indoor everything. So it really is important that everybody takes responsibility in terms of enforcement of this, because if you don't, because it's inconvenient, it's going to get worse for all of us at the end of the day. And I'm sorry, I'm not more positive about that, but I can't make it more clear that for every person that doesn't enforce it, we are putting every other business at risk because of an increase in cases. John's nodding, so I think I handled that <laughs> forcefully enough. Um, uh, along the lines of policing guests, are there de-escalation workshops for employees to know how to manage these situations and avoid negative and or dangerous situations with bad actors? That's something that we can we can look into a, a webinar on in terms of that. Uh, I'm not sure. I would hope that that's something that maybe the state would be helpful with, but I have not uh, seen anything out there, but I'm sure that's another webinar topic that maybe Hope can look into. It's a great idea. Yeah. Ben, especially with what happened in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, Ben put up a link for face shields. Thank you, Ben. Ben also put up that guidance for businesses, which is where you'll find what to do if somebody tests. Um, does the business need to be a member to take the National Restaurant Association survey? I don't think so. Uh, you can just take it. Yeah. All the feedback we can get better is better. Uh, thanks to the entire PRLA staff. Thank you. Michael always thanks us. Uh, thank you, Michael. 
Uh, does the employee have to use vacation sick pay before they receive paid leave through the Families First Coronavirus Response Act? Uh, da, 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 da. I don't think so. But you, you could go on one of those awesome webinars and double check. So I'm going through my notes right now. I do not believe they need to uh, tap into existing leave. As far as I, on a, an employee may elect to substitute any accrued vacation leave, personal leave, or medical or sick leave for the first two weeks of partial paid leave under this section. So, and it, it, there is a cap on how much they get in terms of reimbursement. So they might decide to use their vacation time in lieu of it because they'll get more money. But it says that the employee may elect. It does not say that the uh, employer can mandate. If everyone is like us, front of the house employees feel very strongly about managers and owners making sure that employees are protected as much as possible by requiring that guests follow guidelines regarding masks. They feel we don't care and are not protecting them if we don't do so. That's, that just goes to the point of this isn't just about your employees feeling happy and not wanting to follow the rules because some other elected official told them not to follow the rules. This is about protecting your employees as well. So thank you, Michael. That's a, that's a really good point. Do you have suggestions for restaurants slash bars that are over-serving on a daily basis besides calling the local police? Uh, call LCE uh, and, and if you go on their website, they have a complaint form. They'll do a spot check on that front. Uh, LCE would also be a good uh, enforcement agent on that, especially for people that are over-imbibing. That is a violation under the liquor code. Mm. Then we do have that the NRA survey failed to include a priority for making the ERTC, that's the employee retention credit, tax credit available to P3s. I think that's part of the P3 priorities. I know it is a priority. So uh, we will we can follow up with the NRA. I know it isn't a priority. I think that they were looking for other priorities outside of um, other recovery efforts outside of P3. But yes, ERTC, very valid point. Uh, and it is a priority to be able to use the ERTC outside of the eight or 12 or 24 weeks you're using your P3. Um, is there any recognition by the governor's office of the difference between people getting mildly sick with COVID versus being hospitalized and or in critical condition when determining what restrictions to place on businesses and the public? There's not, and there's a reason for that because if I, have COVID and I'm pretty healthy, I'm going to have mild symptoms. But then if I go and visit my parents, my mom, who's a cancer survivor, she's in the hospital and will potentially die uh, from COVID. So I think there's recognition that it doesn't matter if you have a mild case, who are you spreading it to that could go in the hospital that could be sick. So they are not delineating between mild cases and severe cases because of the community spread that's happening. If you have a case, you could get somebody very sick. So there is no delineation on that front. Uh, thank you, Deborah. We're, we're trying to get, get the answers out there. And, and the daily update today is going to be major. We will put on social media as soon as we get an announcement, uh, whatever it is, even if there's no announcement. Uh, and the daily update, of course, will have every little bit of information in terms of timing, enforcement, rules, regulations. We will get you every single thing that we know uh, and uh, I know you guys are doing the right thing and thank you for that. And we will continue to fight and protect uh, the restaurants that are out there doing it right so you can continue to operate. Uh, that's never going to stop on our end. Uh, and we, we continue to make it very clear that enforcement needs to be taken against the bad actors. Uh, and once we get these cases down, hopefully we continue um, along the path of somewhat normal operations, isn't it? This is my, my snark. Remember when we were like at dull green and 50% and everybody's like 50% is terrible. I can't operate at 50% and by God, don't we all wish we could just stay at 50% right mm. now. So just here we are. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for all the info with regard to the seven counties. Is there any way to get an accurate update before a press release from the governor's office comes out potentially shutting down dining room? We are hopeful and anticipate that an announcement will be made before the shutdown, but 
um, we are not going, one, uh, if we've had information, uh, we aren't going to get it before the governor announces it. And quite honestly, it is for them to announce. So I, I don't think we're going to, I, I, what we're hearing is an announcement today with something happening tomorrow, but we don't know. We, they have not decided what the announcement is going to be and what it's going to contain, which is why John and I are being very careful not to predict what is going to happen because we can't. Um, and we certainly, um, there's so many rumors and mis misperceptions that honestly, I got a call from somebody who said, this is what the announcement's going to be. I still probably wouldn't be comfortable sharing it because of all of the misinformation that's out there. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, yes. And there is a link to report bad actors on the Allegheny County Health Department website as well. Uh, and they said they've been getting a lot of complaints. And that's the other thing. If you aren't enforcing masks, one of your other guests or employees is seeing that and, and turning you in. So it really just universal masking is the name of the game. I mean, heck, Pat Toomey even supports it. So, I mean, if the Republican in the U.S. Senate is on board with universal masking, you know, times are changing. All right, thank you, Sue. I promise I will get on a DMO call soon. John <laughs> keeps on double booking me. It's terrible, really. <laughs> Well, with that, I think this webinar is coming to a conclusion. Thank you guys so much for answering all these questions and everybody for staying on for the full hour. Um, as Melissa said, the update will be going on later today, and we will keep updating our website and keeping you informed as best we can. Everybody have a good and safe day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hope. Thanks, Melissa.